Hello, everybody. Uh, I direct a group at MIT that works on ways to try to understand how complex biological systems work and how they go awry in disease states. So if you think about brain disorders and cancers and immune conditions and all sorts of other problems that we confront, they are so complicated. All the different cell types in the brain or in a cancer or in the body are still not fully understood, even in the normal state. And so very often, attempts to cure or treat diseases end up being governed in the end by luck. Many, many treatments fail, often at very late stages. And I would argue it's because we don't fully understand the principles of biology and of disease. In my specific area, but these numbers and uh, sort of pr problem attributes are quite common across disease, uh, for brain disorders, perhaps a billion people um, around the world uh, have been affected uh, or are affected by conditions like addiction and epilepsy and Alzheimer's and other diseases. And the cost is enormous, but the cost is almost beside the point because these diseases change our time to live, but also who we are, our identity, how we relate to each other very often. So one of the big issues, of course, is how do we cure or treat these diseases? Now, these are some numbers from an editorial about half a decade ago. And I think the numbers have actually uh, gone up since then. But if brain drugs that go out of the lab and into the marketplace where they can help people have a very high failure rate to be approved for clinical use because of side effects, because of poor efficacy, over 90% fail. The cost is enormous. I think the numbers are even higher now, uh, maybe up to a couple billion to take a drug all the way from the thinking and laboratory phase until it can be used in the daily clinical practice. And on top of that, they don't work very well. A lot of the drugs that have been developed do not completely address the root causes of diseases, but rather treat the symptoms. And partly that's because of the incredible biological complexity of the brain and of these other complex bodily systems. Now, it's useful to think about why these are such difficult problems. If you think about the brain, but similar uh, principles hold for other complex body uh, systems as well, one of the tensions is that there's an incredible spatial extent that the brain occupies. Brain cells are enormous. They can be many centimeters in spatial extent. And yet, the connections between brain cells are nanoscale and organized with nanoscale precision. So how do you cross those levels of description to go from the brain circuit that computes things like thoughts and feelings, but don't lose sight of the building blocks, which of course are really important for mechanism and for helping understand and treat diseases. But it's worse. If you zoom into these neural connections, if you look inside these brain cells, you find an incredible repertoire of molecules. So there are thousands and thousands of genes in the genome. These result in gene products, such as proteins, and these, of course, are nanoscale and organized in very complex 3D patterns. And yet we don't have the ability to map how they are organized and how they go into disarray in disease states. So one thing we hear a lot about right now is moonshots in medicine. And it's useful to think about the actual moonshot, which, of course, landed on the moon. So it was a very heroic feat, don't get me wrong, but it was built in very solid science. People understood gravity. People understood aerodynamics. People understood the mathematics of going into outer space. And people knew where the moon was. That's always helpful. Now, the reason that we had a moonshot that worked uh, was because the physics laws were so well worked out. And partly that's because the laws of physics, there's a fairly short list. Um, you could probably fit them all on a single piece of paper. And many centuries of basic science have yielded understandings of atoms and molecules, rockets and aerodynamics, um, how these different principles operate and can be used in engineering, right? So from our understanding of electricity, for example, we can build computing systems, such as those that help navigate um, the moon rocket to the moon. Now, one of the issues, of course, is, well, what if we don't have that scientific grounding? If you think about what would happen if the moonshot happened 500 years ago, people would not have gotten even into outer space, right? All the money on the planet would not get you near the moon because people didn't understand even what was in outer space. Uh, and a lot of the things that would have been tried might have failed, like 
trying to launch hot air balloons into outer space, which, of course, would not have worked. So the question then is, if we really want to have a moonshot to solve disease, we have to build it on a moonshot to accelerate science itself. We need better technologies. We need new models of collaboration. We need new ways to bring people together to address these issues. I'll give you a couple examples from the technology side uh, that we think could help people to deconstruct the building blocks of life and to understand how they're organized and how they go wrong in disease states. How can we map the molecules in cells and the cells in organs, such as the brain, or in a tumor, or in the immune system, and so forth? Well, it's really hard to do that. And so one of the things we've been doing is trying to develop radical new technologies to let you see what's inside a cell, or a brain circuit, or a cancer. What we do is we take inspiration from a relatively old field that goes back many decades, the field of responsive polymers, or smart gels. And these are polymers that drastically change their size or shape when you expose them to the right kind of energy or to the right kind of chemical. So as an example, uh, there's a material in baby diapers that absorbs water. Uh, you know, kids do this experiment a million times a day. Uh, this animation here sort of is an artist's tradition of what this might look like. You have this polymer, and you expose it to water, Water rushes in, driven by osmotic force. The polymer chains get pulled apart, and the baby diaper material becomes larger. So we started thinking, what if we could do this inside a cell, weave a network of these polymer chains so densely and so evenly that they go around molecules, between molecules, and are further co coordinated in a very even fashion so that when you did the expansion, you could push all the building blocks of life away from each other. So the question then is, can we take preserved biological specimens, this of course would not work on a living specimen, and do this trick? And so we came up with some chemical steps. The first thing we did was we developed little molecules that we call anchors. And these molecules attach to biomolecules, such as those shown in brown here, proteins, in this animation. So the little purple blobs are the anchor molecules. And we wash them in, and they bind to biomolecules. Now we have a handle that we could use to pull the biomolecules apart. The second step is we have to install the baby diaper material in that even fashion throughout the specimen. You can't just dump the stuff on top, it'll just sit there. So to do that, we have to use a strategy called polymerization. We wash in the building blocks and then trigger a reaction. So they form these long chains, like a spider web, but in three dimensions, throughout this biological specimen. And any time one of these growing chains encounters one of those handles, it'll form an attachment. And so that can be exactly what we want, because we want a way to have a swellable material apply force to the molecules, and then the handles will convey the force. Finally, we have to loosen up the molecules from each other. Molecules in the body don't like to be pulled apart, so we treat them with chemicals that mechanically loosen everything up. And now, when we add water, what happens? Well, the water's drawn in, again, by osmosis, and then the, the baby diaper-like material will start to swell, but now the biomolecules come along for the ride. And so we can move these biomolecules apart to the point where you can see them using inexpensive imaging devices. Now, there's another cool trick that emerges. By pulling molecules apart, we make room around them. And with it, all, all that extra space, we can run interesting chemical reactions and analyze the building blocks of life. That's important, because the building blocks of life are made out of the same atoms, um, but just in different orders. And so it's really hard to tell one molecule from another using a pure physics technology. We often have to use chemistry. So imagine now, with all the room that we've made around these biomolecules, we can bring in tags bearing little barcodes made out of DNA, for example. And if we assign a little barcode to each molecule, we can then read out those barcodes by sequencing those barcodes right there inside the biological specimen. So the hope here is that we can actually convert preserved biological specimens into expanded states so that, sort of like stars in a constellation, the biomolecules will all hang there, suspended by the polymer, and we can analyze them. It's like you drew a picture on a balloon and then blow up the balloon. It's the same picture, but all the ink molecules have been moved apart. And so what we're doing is kind of like that, but in three dimensions. The relative positions are all uh, organized in the right way, but we can actually map out their three-dimensional organization. So by this point, you're wondering, does it work? So here's a little movie we made, which is a time-lapse 
of a piece of brain tissue. This is from a mouse brain, about a centimeter wide. And we add water now. And the polymer had been embedded earlier. And what you can see is a piece of brain tissue swelling before your very eyes. And it swell swells very smoothly. This movie sped up by about a factor of 50 or so. So the whole process takes about an hour, not a minute. But the process is very even because we designed the polymers to expand very evenly. And also, by mechanically loosening up all the molecules from each other, we can actually get them to separate in an even fashion. We call this technology expansion microscopy, because in contrast to the last several hundred years of imaging, where you use a, a lens to magnify the image, we're expanding the thing itself. So there's all sorts of things that we can do with this now. For example, here's a piece of brain circuitry that's involved with many different functions, like memory and emotion. And we delivered uh, little uh, barcodes or different uh, building blocks to these different neurons or brain cells. And each neuron gets a different color code as a result. This is a technology developed by another group that they call Brainbow, because the, the neurons look sort of like the colors of the rainbow at the end of the day. Except now we've expanded this piece of Brainbow labeled tissue. And you can zoom in, and you can see the circuit, but you can also zoom in all the way to look at individual connections, individual projections. One of my dreams is, could you actually read out what a memory looks like by mapping out how the topology is changing? And not just the topology, but also the molecules. We want to know not just the wiring of the brain, but the molecules along those wires, right? We want to be able to, maybe someday, make a simulation of a brain circuit in a computer. Of course, this is requiring some other technologies to help us complete this, but uh, we're very excited in our group about the possibility of getting comprehensive maps of neural circuits, maybe to the point where you could potentially simulate um, a process, such as a decision, or an action, or a sensation. And of course, if you can map out how different brain cells change in different disease states, you might be able to pinpoint better clinical targets. We don't even know how many kinds of cells there are in the brain, much less how they change in diseases. If we can make those maps, and pinpoint how they change, we can maybe hone in on better treatments and maybe even cures. Now, everything I've told you so far works on static brain circuits, right? Obviously, expanding a piece of tissue is not compatible with the living state. And so one of the things, of course, that we need to do is to assess what happens in the living state as well. And so one of the technologies that we've been doing uh, work on is to try to address the high-speed dynamics of the brain. The brain is so fast. Electrical pulses in our brain are a thousandth of a second long, and yet memory and disease and development and learning take place over years, sometimes even decades. So how can we keep up with the high speed of activity of the brain? A static map can be a great contribution, but ideally we could test the theories that emerge through perturbation and dynamic observation. So we've been working on a second technology, a technology that's now become wide, widespread in neuroscience, and thousands of groups use, use it, which is a way of stimulating brain cells so that you can individually activate them. Now, neurons compute using electrical pulses. If you just put ele electricity in the brain, it'll go everywhere. Ideally, you could aim your activation just at individual cells. And light can be aimed, but of course, you know, neurons mostly in the brain do not respond to light. So we've been working on technology now known as optogenetics, where we install effectively little solar panels in neurons, and now you shine light on them, the solar panels convert light into electricity, and the neurons get activated. Then you can put light into the brain. The brain does not feel pain, so you can bring in optical probes the same way that you know, electrodes have been used for over 100 years, and then activate or shut down brain cells. By activating brain cells, you can figure out how they trigger behaviors or disease states or ways to overcome disease. And by shutting down neurons, you can figure out what they're necessary for. You can delete them just for a second and figure out what happens downstream. Now, of course, you can't just buy a solar panel and put it into the brain. It's too big. And this is where we got really lucky. This is sheer serendipity. It turns out that molecules all over the world are found in microbes, like this single-celled algae, that convert light to electrical signals. So this is an algae that's swimming. And if we zoom into this little eye spot, um, in this animation, you can see how, what it might look like. There are little molecules that sense light and convert light to electrical signals. And electrical signals help that algae swim around, uh, controlling the little flagelli that you saw. 
these molecules respond to light by opening up a little pore and translocating charged particles, ions, from one side of the eye spot membrane to the other. So if you think about it, that's exactly what we want. A molecule that can be installed in a cell because it's so tiny, and if you shine light on it, it'll cause an effect on the cell that's electrical in nature. Now, the second stroke of luck is it turns out that this molecule is encoded for by a tiny piece of DNA. So we can take that piece of DNA, transplant it into neurons using one of the many, many methods of gene therapy that have been developed over the past couple decades. And then the third stroke of luck was neurons, despite not being plants, were able to manufacture these molecules and maybe even more remarkably, install them on the surface of the cell in a proper way. And then the last stroke of luck, of course, is that these molecules just happened to have the right speed and amplitude of effect and effects on cell health that you could control neurons with light by shining light on these molecules, and the cells are healthy. So that's exactly what we need. And again, this is the natural world engineering it for us. Uh, we're not smart enough to, to make these things from scratch right now. Um, but I'll show you what kinds of things people can do to study the brain. Uh, here's one example from a group that studies addiction. I think we've all heard about dopamine neurons. People talk about them sometimes as the pleasure center of the brain. But of course, everything in the brain is complicated. So what if you could take these little molecules, install them using gene therapy vectors into neurons that produce dopamine, shine light on them, and you could figure out, do they really reinforce behavior when you activate just those neurons and nothing else? So using some of these gene therapy tricks, um, uh, Chris Fiorillo's group did this uh, work here with. Uh, they devised a very simple task. Basically, mice w uh, are engineered, um, as often happens in neuroscience, people use model systems like mice, um, with these neurons made light sensitive that make dopamine. And then an optical fiber is put into the brain to shine light on these neurons. If mice go to one point in this little box and poke their nose into a little sensor, they get a pulse of light. If they go to the other side, nothing will happen, sort of a control condition. And here's what happens. Here's the mouse, pokes its nose. You can see the blue laser pulse going down the fiber. Does it again. And so the mouse is basically working for light. This experiment proves that activating this set of cells is enough to reinforce the brain and make it do more of what it was just doing, at least in the context of this task. And so through this causal perturbation, you could start to uh, refine our understanding of what neurons really are capable of. And combined with the mapping technologies we talked about earlier, because of course, if you don't have a map, how do you know what to stimulate, right? The brain is such a messy, complicated thing. You need a map to tell you where to go. Now, we've also worked on ways to enable neurons to be turned off with pulses of light. And um, one of the, th the strategies that we can use is to take molecules that do the opposite. They bring in the opposite kind of charge into brain cells. And we can bring that in, again, using uh, genetic engineering. And so now, when you turn light on, what will happen is negative charge gets brought into the cells, and the cells are then blockaded. So here's some work done by Akihiro Yamanaka's group to investigate you know, narcolepsy. So narcolepsy, human patients will fall asleep at often random and inopportune times. And in patients with narcolepsy, there are atrophy or uh, destruction of certain cells that make a peptide called hypocretin or orexin. So the question then is, is the loss of these cells really causing the sleepiness? But of course, people aren't sleeping all the time, so maybe something more complicated is going on. So their group made a transgenic mouse with a small cluster of cells deep, deep in the brain that make this peptide sensitive to light, and in particular, to be shut down by light. And here's what happened. The mice start out awake, and then after a little while, they turn on the light, and what you can see is, bam, all the mice fall asleep. And then they turn the light off. That's what the yellow uh, shading indicates, is, the end, is uh, when the light period is uh, being conducted. And after the light's off, the mice wake back up. But you can see that there's dynamics. It's not instantaneous. And if you look very carefully at the end of this slide, the mice wake up, but they kind of pass out again. They're a bit groggy. And so what this suggests is that, yes, there is a delicate interplay of these neurons and other circuits in the brain. And it tees apart something like, why do we fall asleep? We have to understand how the circuit operates as a whole. So I'll end there. I want to just end on this slide. There's too many names to acknowledge um, in the remaining uh, zero seconds. 
But um, I want to end on a note that this is an omnidisciplinary endeavor. We're trying to bring together protein biology and chemistry and optics and all sorts of different fields in this quest to help us solve the brain. And by bringing new tools and giving them away as freely as possible to neuroscientists to understand the brain, our hope is that we can really de-risk this enterprise and put us on the path to making treatments and cures more predictable engineering sciences. Thank you.